Um, my name is Persis Karim. I'm the director for the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies, and I want to welcome all of you today to today's presentation, which is a discussion of the film and the historical context of the 1953 coup. If you haven't seen the film Coup 53 by Taghi Amirian, Amirani, sorry. Um, I encourage you to rent it. You can rent it through the Coup 53 website and watch it yourselves. Today's discussion is going to be about the film, but more importantly, about the events. Um, we have with us two historians, and I'm going to briefly introduce them. You'll be muted throughout the program, but if you have questions, um, we can. you can put them in the chat and we will monitor them to make sure they get asked at the point when the two speakers stop conversing. And I'll be reading them. If there's a repeat of questions, I may compile them into one. Um, I wanna thank a few people for today's program because we have a rich community of people who are engaged with us. First of all, I wanna thank some of the people who co-sponsored this event, the School of Cinema at San Francisco State, the Department of History, uh, the Department of International Relations, the Doc Film Institute, and also the UC Berkeley Center for Middle Eastern Studies is participating in today's discussion, as is the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University. I think it's a really interesting thing that we had planned this event, um, well, we actually planned it several years ago um, at Maziar's encouragement, and we were unable to screen the film due to some, due to some issues around permission, archival permissions, and we rescheduled it uh, late last spring for the idea that it would happen this fall, and ironically, Iran is erupting in a what we might consider a revolutionary moment. And um, therefore, I think it lends itself to a really rich conversation about the way history is both um, following us into the present and also we can't read the events of the present without looking back in time. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleagues. Dr. Ervan Abrahamian, who was a distinguished professor of history at the City University of New York. He's now Professor Emeritus of History at Baruch College and the Graduate Center in the City University of New York. He's the author of Iran Between Two Revolutions, The Iranian Mojahedin, Khomeiniism, Tortured Confessions, Prisons and Public Recantations in Iran, A History of Modern Iran and the Coup, 1953, the CIA and Roots of Modern US-Iranian Relations. His books have been translated and published into Persian, Turkish, Arabic, Italian, and Polish. And his latest book, uh, which was published in 2021, is called Oil Crisis in Iran from Negotiations to Coup. And he's now working on another book about the 1979 revolution, and maybe it will include the 1920, I mean, 2022 revolution, who knows? He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Abrahamian. Thank you for the introduction. Um, Dr. Maziar Beruz, who's a colleague here at San Francisco State, was born in Tehran. He's a professor in the Department of History at San Francisco State, and he's authored numerous articles and book chapters on Iran, and his two books uh, on the history of the left movements, in, as well as two books of history about left movements in Iran. His first book, Rebels with a Cause, has been translated into Persian and Turkish. His second book is Perspectives on the History of Rebels with a Cause in Iran, which is a collection of articles and interviews on the left movement in Iran. Most recently, his book, Iran at War, Interactions with the Modern World and the Struggle with Imperial Russia, will be published very shortly in 2023. So welcome, Maziar. And I leave it to you, too, to engage in a conversation and maybe to, to reflect a little bit about the film in case some people have not seen it. You're muted. 
thank you, Dr. Karim, uh, uh, for organizing this and for providing the opportunity for this discussion. And I also like to thank uh, Professor Abraham Yan for putting aside some time to be our guest. Um, Professor Abraham Yan, let us start with uh, the documentary itself. What, how do you, uh, what do you think about it? How do you assess the documentary uh, very briefly, if possible? Uh, I, I think it's actually a very good uh, balanced and I, I think honest uh, account of it. Unfortunately, they got into problems, legal problems. I don't know if you want to discuss that, but it doesn't actually, the legal problems don't affect uh, the historical side of it. So if you want a good history of it, it's a good documentary. Then there's a question about, uh, you know, whether a certain transcript was televised or not televised. This becomes an uh, a issue about the reputation of the uh, of a film company. That doesn't reflect really on the histor historical side of the film. Thank you. Uh as you know well, uh, there are claims nowadays that uh, uh, the coup d'etat either uh, did not happen uh, or it was a national uprising and or uh, it was a coup d'etat against the Shah by Dr. Mossadegh. Uh, and uh, when I was born and growing up in Iran in the 1960s, all the way through the 70s until through 79, we were told in our education that the 1953 event was a national uprising in defense of the Shah. And there was even a square in Tehran named after this uh, uh, on the 28th of Mordad or 19th of August. Um, and it seems also that the people who are doing this are mostly non-academics. Uh, some of them have PhDs, but they are not academics are uh, associated with the former uh, uh, regime, the monarchist uh, sup uh, supporters of, of monarchy. What do you think about these type of claims? Well, they, they claim they're revisionists. And of course, if in history, the revisionism has a good reputation. We are all supposed to revise previous conventional histories. The thing is, there's nothing revisionist about it. This this was actually from the day one of after the coup. This was the official policy set by the CIA and MI6 that they told uh, their diplomats not to use the word coup. They said if they were, you're going to use the coup, use it that the, the two day was going to do a carry out a coup. Or it was it was Mossad there who carried out a coup against the Shah, uh, and then they converted that to the what happened was a, a national Shah uprising. So this was actually a, something right from the start was given, and this of course completely was er eroded with the le leaks about information, CIA documents, uh, people involved in the coup writing their memoirs. So uh, there was a whole basically academic work that uh, destroyed this myth of the uh, no coup uh, national uprising. So what the recent writers are doing is only going back to the very original political line that both the CIA and MI6 set, set up there. Um, so in fact, if you look at, if you look at uh, public statements of both by the US and Britain, there was very consistency from 1953 onwards, uh, never used the word coup for what happened in 53. Uh, so even American diplomats who went to Iran were unaware that their own country had carried out a coup in 53. It was such a taboo topic. Uh, it was like talking about sex in a Victorian dinner table. You didn't talk about that. Similarly, you didn't talk about uh, coup. I got a letter actually from a diplomat when he read my book on coup. He said that he had been trained, this was in the 50s, Persian language, Persian history sent to Iran. It was not until 1960 that one of his Iranian friends told him that there was a coup in 53. 
And he was completely surprised by this. What coup? He didn't know there was a coup. Uh, this is a guy who was trained to actually work in Iran. So this, uh, you could say, in, um, intentional amnesia very, was very systematic. Uh, uh, Professor, what are the uh, uh, archival information available in, in the United States and uh, in the UK, I my understanding is that the CIA basically destroyed much of the uh, archival uh, information on this coup d'état, and that the British have not really opened up uh, their archives. What do we know about that? Well, the, the British def definitely still deny it and uh, don't have not opened up their archives. Uh, you have one person, former C MI6 guy, uh, who actually appears in the film. That's a very good source, Derbyshire, uh, but he is a, a, un, uh, a unique case who goes basically rogue from the MI6 and uh, uh, leaks the information. And on the American side, th th there is a great deal because um, although in the until recently, State Department, CIA was very cautious about releasing documents and they do did doc uh, destroy a lot of documents. They called it in house cleaning and so on. There is still a lot which they held on to and wouldn't release. So you, you know, you probably know there's a 30 year rule that the State Department, CIA is supposed to, after 30 years, publish documents of US relations with any particular country. Well, that when 30 years came, when the State Department published the foreign relations for Iran for that year, for the Mossad that year, it was scandalously skimpy, so scandalously skimpy that the American Historical Association uh, called it a scandal, kicked up a fuss, went to Congress, and Congress then instructed the State Department that they should bring out a, a, a new volume for the Mossadegh period. That volume was supposed to come out years ago. It was delayed, delayed, delayed. It was not until 2017, uh, 2017 that the volume was published. So you have now about a thousand pages, over 300 uh, CIA documents, State Department documents, National Coun uh, Security Council documents that are very quite revealing. And also the CIA has this, what's what they call it, electronic library. And there you can also find a fair amount scattered uh, documents about US relations. Uh, but again, they don't go into the nitty gritty of the coup itself. What they reveal is the great how much US was involved in Iranian politics in buying uh, members of parliament, journalists, influencing Iranian politics internally, even before the coup. There are some documents in preparation for the coup, but not on the coup itself. But there's um, for the coup itself, actually, there is a, what is known as the Wilbur document, which is a gold mine of information on the actual coup of itself, on Mr. Hashtag Mordad. Um, and that was leaked uh, 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 the year 2000. It was leaked to the New York Times and it was on internet. And that is, I think, a very good source, objective source, because it's a primary source because it was written by Donald Wilbur, who was in fact involved in the coup. He knew Persian. Uh, he was in charge of what they call psychological, uh, 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 psychological warfare, which was a fancy term for propaganda. So he was writing basically articles to distribute in Iran to, 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 to prepare for the coup. And he was also given the task of planning the coup, uh, writing the memos for the planning. of. So he has a number of memos in preparation for the coup, which are released in the new volume of foreign relations. Uh, but the, the Wilbur document itself is really a primary uh, detailed document 
which is can be taken as a very reliable because it's not propaganda. It's not for outside sources, readers. It's for an internal CIA. It's a sort of a do-it-yourself book on how to carry out a coup. Uh, an idea with the U.S. is going to carry, need to carry out coups elsewhere. Of course, Guatemala came soon afterwards. And this was a way of a handbook on teaching CIA officials on how to carry out a coup. So the so-called revisionists uh, dismiss this and say, oh, it's only propaganda. It's trying to boost up CIA, uh, basically, image. In fact, it was no way propaganda. It was released and uh, Donald Wilbur didn't dare to release it while he was alive. He left it for someone he trusted to release it after it was safely <laughs> underground. So there he couldn't be basically penalized by the, uh, by the uh, US government. Thank you. These cool, uh, cool deniers also uh, uh, nowadays point to the Iranian constitution, the monarchical constitution for supporting their claim. For example, they say that uh, uh, that Dr. Mossadegh uh, abolished or dismissed the 17th parliament, the 17th majlis, uh, and so on and so forth. What do you think about the constitutional aspect of this whole uh, 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 discussion over the coup d'etat in 53? Yeah, th this has become, of course, the, nowadays the main uh, criticism of Mossad that, that he was unconstitutional and the Shah was the con. The thing is, Iran was, uh, you can say, blessed or cursed by having two separate constitutions. One is the real constitution of the, not the Constitutional Revolution, 1906. There are the documents there. And that constitution was based on West European, especially Belgium constitution. It's it designed a parliamentary system of government where parliament really had real power. Parliament uh, uh, voted for uh, ministers. The ministers were in charge of the executive. The Shah was supposed to be like the Belgium king, uh, a pure, pure pig figurehead who reigned, did not rule. Uh, would, had no real power. So that was the real constitution that was supposed to work that way. But when the royalists talk about the constitution, they talk about what Reza Shah did, which was very different. Reza Shah basically uh, made a mockery of the fundamental laws by, by simply handpicking everyone in the majlis. So he told the Majlis or the deputies who to elect as prime minister, who to elect as various ministers. And therefore, everything ran smoothly, but it was a one-man show. Uh, the constitution was kept there because basically uh, no one would dare in the Majlis to oppose him. They, did, they were all yes-men. Uh, and consequently, uh, there was no constitutional crisis under uh, Reza Shah because basically he, he used the constitution as a rubber stamp for his own power. So uh, when people now talk about, well, the Mossad there uh, violated the constitution, they're saying, well, he was violating the way the things worked under Reza Shah. He, he, uh, the, the Shah was supposed to be basically uh, the ruler of the country. Um, and the, and what, what happened in the 17th Majlis was that the, both the British and the Americans, with the help of the Shah, used a lot of money to get a lot of deputies elected to the 17th Majlis. They didn't have a majority, but they had enough of a quorum to be able to prevent basically the Majlis functioning. Uh, so this, in the 17th Majlis, it elected Mossadegh as, as prime minister uh, and gave him, in fact, uh, special powers, especially after the uprising of Siatir in July 52. But there was enough core of pro-American, pro-British and pro-Shah deputies a minority 
who basically obstructed any type of legislation. So every time um, the Mossad that brought in a reform bill, like say reform the electoral system, reform the land ownership system, uh, reform even question of uh, women voting, whenever this was brought into the majlis, these uh, opposition deputies would find some reason to go on a pilgrimage to Rome or somewhere or go sick. They wouldn't show up. So for months on end, there was really no functioning majlis. So Mossadegh asked the deputies to, to resign so that he could have a new election. And with the new election, then he wouldn't have this uh, smaller opposition and get functioning. So th it was that crisis during to obstructionism that basically led to him basically uh, calling for the deputies to resign, which was actually legal. That was uh, nothing unconstitutional about that. The only new thing was the calling for a referendum to close the match less, and so to have a new match less. And that was a new thing. And the royalists picked on that and said, well, a referendum was unconstitutional at that time. Nowadays, of course, they can't really say that because the Shah often used the referendum too <laughs> for his own purposes. So it, the referendum became a part of accepted in the, in the uh, Iranian constitutional system, although it wasn't there in the 1905-1906 uh, fundamental laws. Yeah, I should add that the founding fathers of the Iranian constitution, monarchical constitution, did a clever thing. They put the oath that the Shah had to take as a clause of the constitution. And in that oath, the Shah was obligated to protect Iran 70 and the constitution itself, as well as Shia Islam, the, the principles of Shia Islam. And the two Pahlavi Shahs really didn't, uh, they, they subverted the constitution, uh, both of them for um, during their reign. Um, so uh, my next question has to do with your assessment of Kashani's role, uh, Ayatollah Kashani's role. As you know, there is a, 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 a recently a book was published that tried to basically base on uh, uh, State Department uh, 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 archives uh, suggested that uh, it was the uh, uh, the religious leaders who actually led the coup d'état. Uh, so, what do you think about that? Yeah, the Kashan has become the lightning rod, and I think a lot of the religiousness. A point to Kashani and his opposition to Mossadegh being crucial for the uh, for the downfall of Mossadegh. The thing is, it's more complicated. Kashani you, was used by the Americans, especially Henderson. Uh, he often had private conversations with Kashani. Uh, and that is, the, that is the American ambassador. American ambassador. So uh, from 1952 on, in fact, there were frequent uh, long secret meetings between Kashani and uh, American ambassador. These are actually, you can see in the new documents, these weren't shown before. And what the Americans did was really butter up Kashani, told him, you know, he was a great leader, not just in Iran for the whole Muslim world and so on. And they uh, tried to break him off from Mossad there. Uh, and they used Kashani in the Majlis, because Maj uh, Kashani was uh, elected to the Majlis, and he had five or six deputies who were followed Kashani. Kashani himself was too proud to be go to the Majlis. <laughs> he didn't think it appropriate for a religious pushed ahead to be involved in the majlis. So he, he never participated in the majlis, but he did have a block of five or six deputies with him. So this was uh, the American strategy was to use uh, Kashani uh, in the political arena to undermine Mossad there. Uh, but he, it, as far as the coup itself was concerned, there is no evidence that Kashani was actually involved in the coup 
Uh, people are often argued that the Chagu Keshan, who came from South Tehran uh, and basically beat up the, in northern Tehran and uh, rampaged Bursad, that's home, uh, were paid for and organized by Kashani. The new documents actually showed that that wasn't true. That money that Americans spent for the uh, Chagu Keshan was funneled through Beh Bahani. Uh, and this was actually this the paragraph that this is mentioned in that the document was kept secret until very recently. The Beh Bahani's name was mentioned. And that same document says that the actual process of the Bisto Ashna Mordad was only kept to very few people. So that would be like Beh Bahani, Zahedian people. And Kashani's name is never mentioned. Now, I think the reason for this is not that Kashani wouldn't have supported the coup. It's just the Americans didn't trust Kashani enough to actually let him know what was going on. So Kashani was made a sort of a fool out of this. And Zahedi had promised him, in fact, uh, in, uh, before that if he came to power, he would give three ministries to Kashani's supporters. So I did also promise the Americans that he would under no condition give any uh, any cabinet seats to Kashani's supporters. And so Kashani was basically taken for a ride as far as the, the, this was concerned. But there is no uh, smoking gun saying that Kashani was actually involved. It is much more Beh Bahani uh, 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 and uh, some minor clerics in the bazaar. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, there's, there's also talk uh, that Mossad should have accepted the final uh, oil settlement deal uh, offered him, the World Bank deal. And you have uh, studied this in detail. Uh, and the people who are saying this are not just uh, supporters of the monarchy, but also from the left, uh, some people or former left uh, are saying that. So what do you think about that offer? Well, I think that they haven't really looked at the offer. <laughs> if you look at the offer, first of all, it doesn't really settle the issue. What it says is that for two years, the World Bank would run the oil industry. I, it would be not nationalized, the World Bank would be. And then uh, after two years, the issue would be settled by international arbitration. And Mossadegh's position was, of course, this undid nationalization, but also in two years' time, he would have been overthrown, he said. And <laughs> there's no guarantee that his future government successor would still be interested in insisting on nationalization. And also, if you look at how the World Bank offer was designed, again, the new documents show this. The head of the World Bank actually was a Republican, very close to uh, Washington Republicans. Before he even offered it to Iran, he ran the offer, what with the British, with the Americans, to make sure that they agreed with it before he took it to Iran. So that it was already basically something that was acceptable to the other side and not acceptable to Mossad. And the, the real issue that Mossad there pinpointed was uh, the, the final settlement would be a compromise about compensation, how much compensation to give. Because by law, once you nationalize, you're supposed to give compensation to the company you've nationalized. Uh, this would be settled by the international court. Mossadegh was willing to settle for that on the condition that the British would either give state what figure they were thinking of, of what it was worth, or basically uh, give an estimate of what they would be planning to give or, or charge. Uh, so I, they wanted a figure. Uh, well, most of them wanted a figure on uh, what type of compensation. 
Uh, he was willing to give all compensation, but he wanted to know a figure. And they were he was worried, for rightly, that they would, would put a, such a compensation figure that it would put Iran basically in debtor's court for the next 100 years. Uh, if, if the British and American intention was to make sure that other countries would nationalize, this would be a deterrent to nationalization, then you can nationalize. But if the penalty is so high that you're going to go in debt for 100 years, then obviously no one is going to nationalize their oil. So what basically was out there, he didn't reject the World Bank offer. He basically said, give, him, give me a figure of what you want for compensation. Uh, and uh, funny enough, or strangely enough, or ironically enough, uh, people who began to criticize Mossad there, who were in contact with the, the Americans, such as Kashani, uh, Baraye, uh, they all criticized Mossad there for even willing to offer any compensation. They argued that Britain should give Iran a compensation for having exploited it. So the, the, they said, you're betraying nationalization because you're willing to even talk about compensation. Well, Mossadegh's argument was by law, in fact, the nationalization law said that compensation would be paid, but he wanted to know what sort of figure that the British were thinking for the worth of the, the industry. So it was a trap. And I think Mossad that was tried to know it was a trap. And I think it's sort of uh, woolly, wishful thinking on well-meaning people who supported Mossad that who thought, well, if he had taken this offer, there could be a settlement, there wouldn't have been a coup in Mossad there, and the constitutional government would have continued. It's wishful thinking. Yeah. Uh, finally, <clears throat> what do you think of the the connection is between what happened in 1953 and what happened in 1979. It's not a direct connection, but there is a very close connection. Uh, the reason is the 1953 coup basically undermined the legitimacy of the monarchy and even the constitutional system. And here, actually, it's surprising. The documents, new documents, are quite revealing about this. The Shah turns out to be would be much more foresighted and politically savvy than the foreign diplomats and many of his advisors. From day one, the Shah insisted that he could not go against the Mossad against nationalization. He made it clear. He said, if I do this, that will jeopardize the legitimacy of the monarchy and my power. He said, I'm not like a Stalin or a Hitler that I can, with the support of my uh, population, I could do something drastic. If I go against nationalization and Mossad there, we, I will basically delegitimize the regime. And he kept to this position, actually, from this is from date one. This is from the week, actually, Mossad there was elected prime minister. The Americans tried to get to persuade the Shah to get rid of Mossad there and appoint someone else. He said, no, I can't do that. Uh, he insisted, basically, that he was going to not get involved in a coup. And he told the Americans and the British, if you want to get rid of Mossad, I don't like Mossad, but if you want to get rid of him, you have to do it through parliamentary means. And this is one reason parliament became so important. But when that failed, even then he was not willing to actually support a coup. Uh, and what the Americans eventually did is basically made him an offer he couldn't choose because he couldn't reject because they said, we're going to go along with the coup. And if you don't go along with it, one of your brothers will become Shah. This was a direct threat that they would replace him with one of There were two brothers who were willing to do to replace him. So that became basically the, what finally forced the Shah uh, that he would basically uh, sign up for the coup. 
Uh, so that I think that that basically undermined the, the regime. So the Shah, when he came after the 53 coup, people talked about people of Russia's revolution, but this was this to cover up the fact that he'd lost legitimacy. So from then on, the Shah was always eager to get some sort of legitimacy. You can't have a regime without legitimacy. And some of the things he did actually further uh, compounded the problems. So what was the white revolution? It was a way of trying to get legitimacy and say, you know, I'm a great revolutionary. I can do more than Mossadegh did. I have basically uh, carried out land reform. Mossadegh wasn't able to do. I'm like a Bismarck who leading a revolution from above. And so I can have new legitimacy, a revolutionary legitimacy. The other thing he did also, which added to, and of course, this white revolution further undermined any support he had among landlords and tribal chiefs and people who support, would have supported him in 53. In the 70s, they were not there to support him. Another thing why of getting legitimacy was the 2,500 year celebrations, uh, that he was part of a long uh, history of, of imperial monarchies and uh, this uh, here, actually, the British ambassador was quite observant. He said, he said, these celebrations are all designed to get basically populist uh, legitimacy because this regime is so fragile. Uh, he couldn't explain why it was fragile, of course. He would have to have gone back to 53. But he admitted at the type of height of the celebrations when all these uh, royalties, all these presidents were coming to Iran to pay their allegiance to the Shah. He pointed out that basically the regime was fragile within the country and the Shah needed this sort of big party to uh, cover up the facade of fragility. And of course, the other thing was about uh, OPEC. Um, the Shah then tried to grandstand that he was uh, at the vanguard of oil price rise and so on, which was all baloney because he had nothing to do with the oil price rise. It was the Arab countries who cut oil production after the uh, uh, Iraq, uh, is, uh, the Arab war, Israeli war. 1973, yeah, yeah, the prices quadrupled. And they cut they because they cut prices, and the Shah couldn't actually influence prices. He could go to the uh, to OPEC and say you raise prices, but he couldn't really influence rise of prices because by uh, Iranian oil was not nationalized. Iranian oil was run by the consortium, and they decided how much oil to produce or not produce. It wasn't the Shah, so that was again a lot of grandstanding. And of course, another grandstanding was to making Iran a big uh, military power uh, to s appeal to nationalism that, you know, Iran is now a big power in the Middle East. This again actually further eroded his legitimacy because this basically confirmed people that he was a puppet of the West. Why was he buying so much arms? Why had he appointed himself the American gendarme for the Persian Gulf? Uh, so that this again added to why that, that he was really not a fully dependent, independent uh, ruler, but very much a creation of the of the West. So when 1979 came along, I think the reason the system collapsed so quickly was it didn't have legitimacy. Uh, and here, the, actually, the American. Uh, uh, substitute ambassador writes a memo saying there's no one the Shah can negotiate because all the political leaders consider him illegitimate. So how can you really even compromise? <laughs> and why are they why why is he illegitimate in Secretary because of 53? So I think that that in that way you can say the roots go back to 53. One may add also that uh, it also ended the, the constitutional processes in Iran uh, to the point that a return to the 1906 constitution was not a big issue 
in 1978-79 uh, as a result of the coup d'etat. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two reasons for that. One is that basically with 53, the fall of Mossad there, it wasn't just the National Front that suffered, also the whole notion of constitutionalism suffered. Uh, so that the new generation was much less adamant about constitutional rights and much more uh, intransigent. Uh, there's an interesting speech that Khamenei made when he was uh, uh, Imam Jomei of Tehran in uh, 1981. It was on the anniversary of Mossadegh's death. The, the National Front, uh, the Democratic National Front and the left had a big demonstration in Tehran uh, commemorating Mossadegh's death. And Khamenei from the pulpits announced that we are not liberals like Alendi, who the CIA can snuff out. He didn't want to use Mossadegh's name, but clearly Alendi was synonymous with Mossadegh as a, a basically a, a, a radical reformer who was also peaceful and constitutional. So here was the new tendency that basically, uh, if you have a, a constitutional or a, someone like Mossad there, he is weak, he can be easily overthrown by the CIA, and we're not types like that, you can do the same thing. There's another factor I think that comes in that and undermines constitutionalism, is that because of 53, uh, the new people are in the late 60s, people like Al Ahmad, basically uh, are, uh, they're also basically under the shadow of 53. But their position is that anything that comes from the West is Gharb Zadegi, including uh, Western, constitution. Westification. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Western creation. And he lumps everything he dislikes uh, as part of Western plague, basically, in, uh, including the Constitution. So for his, the hero in his book is, of course, Nouri, Sheikh Nouri, who opposed the Constitution. So there's a change in discourse from constitutionalism, I would say, from liberal politics to, to a much more uh, intransigent, anti anything anti West, including Constitution. Thank you, Dr. Abrahamian. Uh, uh, Dr. Karim, we are ready uh, to take questions uh, if you are. Yes. Um, well, there's a question here that I'm going to read um, that's from. Shahpur Matlub. Do you think there was any way the Shah could have worked with Mossadegh to avoid the coup and remain Shah? Did you hear that? Yes. Well, the, the Shah, the Mossadegh was not against the monarchy. Uh, he wanted the monarch as a uh, basically head of state, uh, someone who reigned rot rules. So he, he was not a Republican that way. So he was quite willing to uh, basically live with the Shah. But the question was whether the Shah was willing to live with a prime minister who took the Mashrutiyat seriously. And this, of course, came at this issue, the bone of contention here was the military, who, who controlled the military. Uh, Reza Shah was not only the commander in chief, but he was, he was head of the army. Uh, and the Shah really wanted to continue this tradition um, and continue to basically be personally in charge of the military. And uh, most pr uh, prime ministers uh, were willing to let the Shah actually control the military after. 1941, after Reza Shah left, there were two exceptions. Ironically, it was Ghavam and Mossadegh 
who took the constitution seriously and argued that the military should be under basically under the cabinet, the war minister, and the war minister should be able to appoint the chiefs of staff. And it was this issue that uh, basically exploded in uh, CRT in f- July 50, uh, 52. And that became the ba- basically important crisis between the two. Thank you. Um, there's a question here uh, that pertains to the film. And the person is, uh, is saying, I was confused about something at the end of the film. If the general claimed to be the real prime minister, how come the Shah had such absolute power? What happened to the role of the prime ministry anyways? Did the general have any increase in power after the coup or did he remain only under the Shah's direction? This is General Zahedi they're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, uh, the Shah uh, went along with the coup. He never trusted Zahedi. <laughs> uh, um, so he basically uh, permitted Zahedi uh, or lived with Zahedi uh, in a sort of tense situation for a number of years until Zahedi managed to sign the consortium agreement. Again, the Shah wanted to basically have someone else take responsibility. And after the consortium agreement was signed, basically, uh, the Shah is more uh, Zahedi out of the country. Uh, there's a scene, actually, in Zahedi's memoirs. He writes about his last meeting with the Shah. Uh, and this is after Zahedi has been forced to resign. Uh, he asked the Shah how soon should he leave the country? And the Shah looks at his watch and says as soon as possible. Uh, I might add that uh, the consortium deal was signed in 1954 and that Zahedi was not uh, the Shah's choice to become prime minister. It was the choice of the British and the Americans. Uh, so uh, he didn't really last that long. I mean, we have 53 coup d'etat, and then at the end of yeah. 54, he's gone. Yeah. Actually, if you actually look at the future uh, 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 careers of the officers who were in the coup, <laughs> uh, very few of them survived more than a few years. The Shah didn't trust them any more than he trusted Zahedi. Uh, he had to rely on them for the actual Bistash de Mordan. But once he could, he here you can see actually his, the Shah's political cute, uh, astuteness. He managed to ease them out of the out of positions of power, even out of the country. So uh, they were not considered like heroes. Uh, from the Shah's point of view, if you're an officer and you make a a, a, rev, a coup in uh, for the Shah. Uh, on behalf of the CIA, you can very well make a coup against the Shah on behalf of the CIA. <laughs> so, so there was no real trust between uh, any of these elements. Thank you. There's a question about um, the use of the words reigning versus ruling. And the question is, you've mentioned both Mossadegh and the constitution conceiving of the Shah as reigning, not ruling. Can you talk a little bit more about what the difference might be here? Well, reigning is like what Western monarchs, basically the authority they had, not authority rather than power, like the British monarchy. You are a titular head of the state. Uh, you sign certain documents to make the documents fully legal. But they're basically presented to you by the politicians and you, it's a formality that you sign. Uh, so you, you, it's not really the power you have of legislation, but basically it's uh, putting a signature to something that's already decided uh, in, in, uh, in, especially in parliament or the cabinet. So it's, it's more authority rather than power. Uh, and that was how most constitutions or constitutional monarchies functioned. Um, the, basically on the Belgium and the British. Okay. Um, there's 
to three questions about thinking about the coup that I'm going to lump into kind of one. Um, so one of the questions is what role the US and the CIA played in bringing Khomeini out of exile? And how does this contradict or complement their role in the 53 coup? And then two other questions are asking, um, what's the relationship, if any, between 1953 coup and what's taking place in Iran today with the woman-led revolutionary movement? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, misconceptions or conspiracy theories that somehow the CIA or the British had a role in uh, appearance of Khomeini. Uh, they hardly knew what was going on actually by 77, 78. The, the misconception that somehow the CIA was masterminding everything is just not borne out in the documents. They, in fact, were very ignorant of what was going on. And the reason they were ignorant is what was, I was just saying before, the Shah didn't trust the CIA. So after he consolidated power, uh, his dealings with the US was, yeah, I'll be a friend of US, I'll buy US arms, uh, but the CIA basically should keep out of Iran. Consequently, the CIA through the, uh, the late 60s, 70s, ha had very little uh, presence in Iran. The only presence was in the northern border, border monitoring uh, Soviet, uh, basically, uh, space, uh, 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 space flights from Central Asia. Uh, but they had very little activity in Iran because the Shah was worried that he, the CIA might actually uh, organize maybe another coup against him, but he didn't want that. And so he, it was quite clear to the, especially the Nixon administration, that the CIA should not really function within the country. So the result was when the revolution came, it, was, it took the American CIA by surprise. And they really had to dig out to find out who were the opposition people were. They didn't even know who the National Front leaders were. Uh, Khomeini, they, they didn't really who knew who he was. They knew some, that he, somehow he had been expelled from Iran. But the idea that somehow the US or the British created uh, the Khomeini movement is completely far-fetched. It's, it's uh, again, a, a grand conspiratorial theory that generally has no, no basis at all. I mean, the joke used to be that if you took up uh, Khomeini's beard, it would be said, made in Britain. But of course, that's a good joke, but it's not, a, it's not any based on reality. And the connection, the question asked between 53 and what is happening now? Dr. Abraham Young? Uh, well, 50, 53, that's a coup. Uh, at present, what you have is a so social movement, basically, especially led by women, about women's rights. Uh, and here, I think what you've, you can see it, indirect connection is the discourse now in street politics in the opposition is basically a discourse of rights, of individual rights, of choice, whether one should wear a scarf or not, or what, what music one should listen to or whatever, or where is my vote? What's happened to my vote? Why don't I have a choice in elections? These are uh, basically demands that are very much go back to the Mashrutiat. So there is a return, I would say, to the discourse of the uh, pre-Islamic revolution, the, the discourse that existed in Iran from basically from 1906 to 1953, that was then overwhelmed by the discourse of Garb Zadegi, of a rejection of the West. And I think what you're seeing now is uh, actually re a disenchantment with the discourse of Islam and return, uh, whether consciously or not, to the discourse which Mossad there 
and the constitutionalists had. And following some of the basically press in Iran, not the official press, but less mainstream press, there seems to be a great deal of interest and nostalgia actually for the older Iran before 79, before basic, which means going back to the ideas of Mossad, the, uh, uh, the constitutional leaders, De Khoda, the intellectuals of that period, are much more, I think, in tune to what people are demanding uh, in the streets nowadays. There's a, a question specific to the period of the coup here about efforts by the two day or labor or labor movements to organize mass opposition to the coup. Uh, may I say something about that before Irvan talks? Yeah. Uh, so uh, about the two day party, remember a couple of things. First of all, the two day was, party was an illegal party during the tenure of Mossadegh. It had been declared illegal a few years earlier. So it was underground. It could not openly function and it had to create this dummy publication and organizations in order to be able to function. Secondly, um, the, uh, uh, after the coup d'etat, uh, you know, before the coup d'etat, the today was claiming that they would defend uh, uh, they would act react against uh, a coup d'etat, that they would t turn a coup d'etat uh, into, uh, de they will defeat a coup d'etat. And then they, they, they didn't act that much. They didn't do anything. Uh, and of course here, uh, I'm gonna give the uh, podium to uh, Professor Abraham Yon to uh, continue and say why it didn't. I, my thesis is that first of all, they, there was many differences among the leadership uh, the factionalism that uh, uh, played a role, but also defending Mossadegh uh, with uh, the type of uh, network that they had in the military, uh, as uh, Professor Abahamian has argued, would have been uh, very uh, difficult, if not impossible, to react. But go ahead, Ervan. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we don't know because we don't have the transcripts of what went on in the Central Committee of the Two-Day Party during the Mossadegh period. What is clear is in the early period, they were basically critical of Mossadegh for not being anti-American. They felt that he was basically, that there was a conflict between British imperialism, American imperialism, and Mossadegh was basically allied with American imperialism, and therefore they should oppose him. Um, so a lot of the criticism of the two-day position is actually on this period. But after Seatir, that position changed, and they became basically fully supportive of Mossadegh after Seatir. So at the time of the coup, basically they were following Mossadegh's position and they were willing to basically do whatever Mossadegh wanted. In fact, on the day of the coup, uh, the two day as well as some of the National Front wanted Mossadegh to distribute arms so there would be resistance. Uh, but it was Mossadegh who uh, decided against such a policy. Now we can go on to what, why or what but was the mistake or not. But the, it wasn't like they were not willing to oppose. Their position was that if they were going to actually actively oppose, they would have to do it with the support of the Mossadegh government. I, they were not powerful enough themselves uh, to carry out basically the, the whatever resistance. Uh, and that the onus was basically then on the go Mossadegh government to give the way the leadership. Uh, they even offered to uh, actually organize Mossadegh's escape from prison uh, if he was willing to do that. He wasn't willing to do that. Uh, Fateh Mi remembered Mossadegh's uh, right-hand man and foreign minister. He actually escaped for a while from uh, the, uh, the Shah's clutches and he hid 
in the two-day underground until he was captured and then executed. So I think there was much more complicated than I think I think bit uh, uh, Mazior read is uh, uh, hits it on the nail. They didn't have the pos- the power to actually carry out uh, on their own uh, a, a massive resistance. Uh, they could have done it only if it was in coordination with the National Front and the Mossad their supporters. Uh, there is also a sort of added complication. There is a period when the two day actually sent military support to the Rashkhaiz because they thought the Rashkhaiz were uh, in opposition to the Shah. Uh, and the new documents showed that actually the two day misunderstood the situation. The Rashkhaiz were in opposition to the uh, Shah, but they wanted to carry out their own coup because they were in fully cahoots with the United States. Uh, the CIA basically had its main base in Iran at the, uh, in the at that time in the Rashkhai areas. So they they poured money and arms into the Rashkhaiz. So the Rashkhaiz were basically uh, as another fifth column for the United States. If if the coup had failed, uh, the Mostarashtra border had failed, they would have then resorted to the uh, Rashkhai revolt. And the British would have resorted to a Bakhtiari revolt. There's a division of labor between the US and the uh, British about uh, which uh, tribal group they would work with. So uh, the, the, the question of two days often a red herring about this whole situation. I don't think they were uh, instrumental enough either way to prevent a coup or actually carry out a new coup themselves. Can I, I wanted to ask a question about the film because to me, the film is kind of the, one of the big arguments that the film is making is the way that the British role has been underplayed historically. And also um, that in fact, it, it comes across as if the, the British pushed the Americans. And I wonder what your read on that in the film is um, that, it almost seems like the US was kind of the new kid on the block and the British figured out how to manipulate them into doing some of their dirty work. Um, yeah, I think this actually for what's it in this course is different in Britain from here. Here we actually look at American documents, what the US did. In Britain, the concern is often why is Britain not saying anything about this coup? Why is it silent? Uh, no documents are released. And here, of course, the main uh, important document that they use is the Dar- Derbyshire document. And Derbyshire's main point was that, hey, MI6, he played a major role and he had been erased from history because there is no credit given to the British for having carried out the coup. Uh, So there is that sort of question about a national how important each country was in the coup. And the British would like to say, yes, we're, we were also very important. And I think the CIA documents actually show, say that uh, without the CIA, the coup wouldn't have occurred. But the British were also had a major import, uh, especially when it came to uh, finding, identifying which army officers were willing to carry out a coup and in that, the British were knowledgeable, the CIA and the Americans were not. Um, but the other question about the British manipulating the Americans, uh, th- this has a long history among a, a British uh, document, a British uh, activity, British participants in the coup. Uh, in their memoirs, they write that, you know, they came to America and they were trying to uh, bring the Americans into a coup and they, they intentionally used the term they used, the communist boogie, 
told Americans that Iran is about to go communist. And therefore, this was what the Americans then fell for. Yeah. But if you look at the American documents, even the CIA documents, they know that there was really no communist bogey. They were, they were not basically bought by that. And the idea that somehow uh, foreign office officials could come to Washington and the people they dealt with, like the Dulles or Eisenhower, or, or Henderson were naive simpletons who could be taken for a ride <laughs> is a bit far-fetched. Uh, it, 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 it fits into the idea that Americans are naive. They don't know what was happening, but the British are always very perfidious. They know what to do. It fits into that discourse. But in reality, the American uh, decision makers in Washington were quite savvy about what was going on. And they didn't go into the coup because the, Brit the British uh, hepped up the idea of a, a, a communist bogey. They did it because of their own interest, which was against uh, the nationalization success. Thank you. Okay, there's another question. Uh... Samira is saying, I'm interested to learn more about the psychological warfare or propaganda that you mentioned. What intelligence did the CIA and MI, MI6 have about what kinds of propaganda people would believe? I asked this thinking about the current divide in the Iranian community regarding the roles of some Iranian American activists and entities, and having watched how easily a sort of mob mentality takes over in heated moments like this. Well, I, this goes back to what is known as nowadays known as fake news, and people think it's fake news is a new discovery. But in this in this period, you find actually there's a lot of fake news, and what the MI the well, what MI six and CIA did was basically implant articles or pamphlets in Iran that were completely fictitious, basically. They would uh, distribute a list of clerical leaders that were going to be executed after the revolution. <laughs> this obviously uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, assure the clerics that th their lives were safe, but this all turned out to be completely uh, manufactured articles. Another one um, was that you know, MI6 distributed, and this was actually the, the, the CIA distributed uh, pamphlets uh, that uh, Fatemi, Khomeini's uh, right hand man, was in fact. Mossadegh's uh, right hand man. Sorry, Mossadegh. Well, who did I say? Khomeini. No, sorry, Mossadegh's right hand man, that he had. Uh, converted to Baha'ism and Christianity. And of course, this for religious fanatics like Fedayana Islam was a, a, a crime to be uh, to be handled as with assassination or execution. And it's no accident that a Fedayana Islam person actually tried to assassinate um, uh, Fatemi. So you, 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 these are a lot of actually, you can say, fake news with really bloody consequences. Uh, there was part of the what was called psychological warfare, <laughs> but what it simply was was fake, fake information. Of course, nowadays living in the United States, we are familiar with what fake news yes. is <laughs> and how it works. Yeah, we have Twitter now too. <laughs> um, I wonder, we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to encourage anybody else who might want to ask a question either about the film or about this historical circumstance. I wonder, it would be a shame of us not to engage the two of you to talk a little bit about developments in Iran um, now, not necessarily drawing any parallels between uh, the coup, but uh, 
when Maziar and I were in a teach-in at the beginning of these protests in early October, things were a little different and they've changed, I think, considerably in that now we do have um, oil workers who are participating in strikes. We have a wider cross-section of the population participating in strikes, and we have a widespread protest movement throughout Iran. So I want to invite the two of you to maybe weigh in on the history in the making, and if you have any uh, predictions, which is always tricky, um, about what might be taking shape in the coming months if it continues and I mean, 14,000 people have been arrested and it doesn't seem to be letting up. Uh, like I, uh, you know, we, we discussed this process before. I don't think this is a revolutionary movement. I think it's a social movement. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, uh, because it lacks uh, uh, leadership and organization, um, it can go each uh, uh, every which way. There is a very shortcut, big shortcut between uh, protesting against veil to wanting to overthrow Islamic Republic. And there must be organization, there must be uh, the ability to take steps toward that direction maybe some, uh, more achievable goals should have been uh, chosen for uh, this confrontation. But then for that a leadership, there must be organization and leadership which there isn't. There is a lot of anger, I can understand that. There is a lot of sacrifice going on. There is no crack in the government. Uh, I do not see any crack. Uh, and uh, like I said in October, and uh, I am still not very optimistic about this going uh, uh, to topple uh, the system. Uh, maybe after it uh, cools down, there can be concessions given. Uh, maybe, I don't know. But I'm not good in predicting future anyway. <laughs> the future. Iran? Well, I mean, it's not so much between now and 53. There's a long history in Iran of protests taking to the streets. I mean, that, that is basically history of mass movements in Iran is uh, the Constitutional Revolution, the nationalization movement, uh, the 1979 revolution. So street protests are, I think, ingrained into Iranian history. But for those protests to turn into a revolution, you need not only, I mean, you need organization as Mazir said, but I think you need also take into account a class basis. Uh, where they've been successful, like in the Mashrutiat, in the oil nationalization, then in 78, is the role of the petty bourgeoisie. Now, if you don't like that term, petty bourgeoisie, we can call it, you know, the Bazaar Mosque Alliance, uh, less uh, controversial terminology. But that becomes crucial in 79. That revolution would not have succeeded without uh, active participation of the petty bourgeoisie. And I don't see that happening now so far. There have been some bazaar strikes, especially in Baluchistan and uh, Kurdistan, but you haven't really seen extensive of that uh, type of strikes uh, in uh, other major cities. And the reason for that, I would say, is that this state still has some roots in that uh, petty bourgeoisie. In fact, most of the leaders of the Islamic Republic come originate from the petty bourgeoisie. Their families are there. Their culture is the, that of the petty bourgeoisie. They, are, uh, they see the Islamic Republic as a protection of their class interests. So until they, you see a break there, and then, and then you'll see a break in the state, I don't see the, the system collapsing. So I'd agree with Mazir 
on that the, the protests will, could go continue indefinitely, but whether the regime would actually crumble like it did in 79 is very different. Uh, I think that I mean another difference is tied to that is that by 78 the old regime had no legitimacy. This regime has cons- systematically eroded its legitimacy. It had a great deal of legitimacy in 79, 80, but it has chopped down its its own supporters. It's even cut chopped down its roots, but it still has some roots in the. Uh, petty bourgeoisie, and consequently has some cl- uh, class uh, basis to survive. By petty bourgeoisie, it means, uh, uh, somebody asked the question, by petty bourgeoisie, we mean uh, basically those uh, uh, type of uh, businesses that are small or uh, in the uh, associated with the traditional productions, like in the bazaar uh, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, small shopkeepers, small businessmen, small uh, uh, producers uh, uh, who are mostly involved in traditional way of uh, functioning. Uh, uh, what I would like to add to Professor Abraham Yon's point is that this regime, uh, the, the, the current government, the current system has a social base. I mean, this is what uh, I think Professor Abraham Yon is trying to say and which I agree. Uh, and that social base, it may not be, uh, uh, you know, it may, it may be 10%, maybe 7%. I'm saying, I'm talking about the way elections are held. I'm talking about uh, the numbers who participate and vote. I mean, when I put this all together, I think it's around 10%. But 10% that is loyal. And that loyalty will make a difference when the state tries to uh, suppress and use violence. Uh, it can rely on that loyalty. And I think much of the things that it is doing today, much of the step is taking today, uh, including what triggered this whole thing, which is uh, uh, forced veiling, uh, has to do with addressing that social basis, uh, cultural, uh, political uh, uh, needs. Uh, and uh, so in that context, unless you see some sort of a crack in the system, in, in the one upstairs who are reigning, who are ruling, uh, I doubt that this will bring about a major mm. change. But I think the crisis could, could continue indefinitely. It could be an ongoing crisis because you basically have Islamic regime that has a population that is very disenchanted with its own inter- with the interpretation of Islam and legal aspects of a light of Fari. And you the people now demonstrating are people who went to Islamic kindergartens, Islamic primary schools, Islamic <laughs> secondary schools, Islamic colleges, Yet they are opposing the, the regime. So it's the ideology of the Islamic revolution really has failed to create a national, basically, consensus. And, uh, and I, the way also the regime has acted is alienated, let's say, liberal Islamicists. Uh, even uh, more radical Islamists, uh, evangelical Islamists, it's uh, cut to the point that it's basically, let's say, 10%, 15% of the population still is loyal to the Islamic Republic. But this is very far-fetched from uh, 1980, 81, where in plebiscites, the Islamic Republic used to get 80% of the uh, uh, vote. Uh, in the last election for president, it was less than 50% participation. In Tehran, I think it was less than 30%. So it's really a drastic erosion of, of support. And the regime based its basically legitimacy that it was based on a popular support. Is it is it then possible that there that this could go on and eventually their legitimacy will wane in such a way that 
if another movement breaks out in five or six years, there will be less legitimacy and perhaps more organized opposition. And that would be the circumstance that would be better for a revolutionary movement. I mean, it's hard to predict how things, I mean, there might be a war with Israel, United States, the situation, but if if constant crisis continues, is possible the past stars might take over, in which case that would further erode legitimacy because, you know, Ahuns claim that they can speak for God, but some, you know, general, uh, past star general is going to have trouble convincing the faithful that he is actually a, a specialist in fair and he knows what God's laws are. So that if there was a a guard, a, a past star coup, that would further erode, I think, the uh, popular legitimacy. Okay. There is one more question about the coup, and I want to make sure that we give uh, that person a chance to hear from you. Uh, are you familiar with the extent to which the 53, 53 coup is actually taught in Iranian schools? Um, I'm not familiar, but I'm sure it's not, uh, because, of course, this uh, is deals with Mossad uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, oil nationalism. It's not things that the, the regime, all it would deal with, with, they would say, would be that uh, this is another basically of imperial imperialism and intervention in in Iran, uh, but they're not really in, uh, the regime is not that interested in fifty three the coup. Uh, some newspapers are uh, more sort of liberal leaning, uh, secular leaning papers that function in Iran are very interested, but um, they're not that interested in the details of what happened in 53 cool. Um So, I mean, a lot of people are interested, but whether the state itself is is actually would rather uh, uh, forget about it. <laughs> Here they have that in common with, I think, America. Uh, to give you an example, my, the, my book on oil crisis in Iran uh, that was translated uh, in Iran. Uh, Nay publishers announced that it was going to be sold, but Ershad actually stopped it. And when the translator asked them uh, why they had stopped it, whether there was anything in the in the book that they objected to. They said they, they had nothing in the book they objected to, but they didn't want the book published. Mm -hmm. So my example is that my indication is they, they're really not that interested in people reading about the 53 coup. Yeah, they'd rather focus on the Shah, I guess, because he's an easier one to uh, cite as the problem, right? Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, I want to thank you both very much, especially Dr. Oh, yeah, Dr. Abrahamian for joining us. I know it's late where you are. So thank you for staying with us. Um, and thank you, Dr. Beruz, for your thoughtful questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we're going to record this. So any of you who want to listen again, um,